four, three, two. And we are live for the Steelers Depot live stream here on Monday, July 26th. As always, I am Alex Kazor. With me is Dave Bryan. Dave, the Steelers are starting training camp. All the pads come on on Wednesday. They'll get back to practice on Tuesday after having Monday off. So we finally have a lot of football to, to talk about and to hopefully talk about a whole lot more this week. How are you doing, Dave? Doing good. Uh, happy Monday. This is kind of the uh, the last breath of uh, that, 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 you know, kind of a, a mini break, if you will, today. And then, uh, uh, boy, it's going to be nonstop from here on out. I mean, it really feels like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tuesday is really when training camp begins, even though training camp's already underway. Uh, obviously, moving over, they're moving from uh, the UPMC Rooney Sports Complex uh, over to Heinz Field. They'll have a practice on Tuesday, and then things will start opening up to the public on Wednesday. So excited for mm-hmm. uh, you to get back out there and start uh, start getting some real information, if you will. All right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So really excited to get back out there. I've not been to training camp in, in far too long. So uh, let me know, guys, on, on Dave. Dave, test your audio one more time for me. Just you got you were We could hear you, but you were just robotic, Dave. So test it for me. Testing. One, 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 one. Anybody? Do I still sound like a robot? Did Should you have the right good. setting? Yeah, it, I feel like it changes every single time because I, I I don't know, but it should be good now. Let me know, chat, and then we will start into the questions. Mutated genome and last style bender says he's good, so all good there. And some good uh, information from uh, Albert Breer, uh, Sports Illustrated's Albert Breer, talking with Ben in an article that went up this morning. Dave, you wrote a couple articles off of that and some some good information uh, there. So let's get to the questions and say hello to the chat. Again, we'll be here from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time, answering as many Steelers questions as possible. I'm sure the chat could be a little little bit busier with camp uh, starting out. So if you want to have your question be guaranteed to be asked and answered, be sure to leave Dave and I a super chat. We'll kick things off here saying hello to John and Kevin. And Kevin has the first question here and says, Alex, if you had to make one trade to sure up, up, uh, sure up a position before the season starts, which position would you tackle and why? It's a good question, Kevin. Um, probably safety because I think it's probably where they're the, the weakest right now after really, I think, bolstering the outside linebacker group with the addition of Melvin Ingram. I think that was a really key signing for the Steelers. So I would say safety. But at this point, obviously, you just want to see, A, a what injuries happen, B, how the young guys look and compete and really evaluate your own roster before you start um, talking about depth and where you have to, uh, where, where the needs to address. So I would say safety right now, but things are very much subject to change. Mike Adesso says, happy time for Alex to finally go to training camp. Uh, Alex, the day has come. What's three things you'll be watching for this week? It's such a, it's a big question, Mike, and it's an important one. Um, I try not to hyper-focus in on one thing, but I've kind of outlined the two issues for the Steelers this year. The two biggest issues, at least, are the offensive line and the secondary with a ladder and the secondary. What guys are going to carve out roles in sub-package, get eyes on Antoine Brooks Jr., seemingly the, the current early front runner for the slot job, Arthur Millette, James Pierre is an outside corner. Then you look at the offensive line, the young guys like Kendrick Green, Dan Moore, how that group just plays as a unit. Those are all things that will be important to look for as well. And then the quarterback battle for the number three spot between Dwayne Haskins and Josh Dobbs will probably one of the, be one of the more popular ones to talk about, although hopefully it won't mean a whole lot for this season. But a whole lot to look at. Uh, Dave, what are some things you're going to be keeping an eye on and, and wanting to know about uh, come training camp? Uh, you know, just uh, in, in general, the rotations on the offensive lines to start with. I think that's always something that that, that I pay attention to. Uh, obviously, some reports on some of these, uh, you know, rookies, the guys that we don't know a lot about, you know. And, and look, I mean, the roster's full of those kind of guys right now there. So, uh, uh Let's see what else, what else? Uh, just kind of the rotations of the nickel spot, mm-hmm. uh, you know, kind of all the things that that the biggest questions that we have, I think, or have had uh, over the course of the last several weeks there. Uh, you know, James Pierre is a guy I'm very interested uh, interested to see what the reports are on on, on him. Uh, obviously, Chiquamo Corfor shifting over to the left side. Well, I mean, I could. 
uh, you know, limiting me to just three things, I think is tough, but uh, uh, definitely the, uh, the slot, uh, what, what's going to happen there in the slot nickel position, I think uh, for, for, for starters is going to be uh, one of the biggest questions, uh, I, you know, uh, pieces of info that I'm looking into. And then you know, obviously some of the stuff like, you know, the, that, that number three quarterback spot, you know, a lot of focus on Dwayne Haskins, uh, obviously this off season, interested to hear, you know, to, to, to see your st- statistical breakdown on, mm-hmm. on those kind of things as well too. So uh, a lot of things and, and more than, more than anything, I would just say the, the players that we don't know the most about the, a lot right. of the newer players. Yeah, even the, the second-year guys. Like, we don't know much about Antoine Brooks Jr. just because we've barely seen the guy or anything to McFarland. And so for our purposes, less so it be the, the coaching staff, although still to a, a great extent, but for our purposes, really getting a good feel for who these guys are because we just, we've seen 30 snaps of Antoine Brooks in his career, and we've seen, you know, whatever it is, 100 for McFarland. What, I don't know how many snaps he played on offense last season, but, but somewhere around there. And so um, it's just good to get eyes on these guys to get a feel for how they look in person. Next question here comes from John Pennington, who says, Dave and Alex, do you think the Steelers should claim Jalen Twyman off waivers, then put him on the shelf for this season while he heals for next year? And how much would that cost the Steelers? Twyman was the uh, was just cut by, was at Minnesota yesterday. He'll revert to NFI if he does not get claimed off of waivers. He was shot, I think, four times in Washington. Uh, D.C. expected to fully recover, which is, of course, great news. I probably wouldn't. I, I don't know if I'll get all the mechanisms here right, Dave, but if you claimed him, then he's going to have to pl- probably be on IR this year, I'm guessing. Um, that's what that, that was the intent of Minnesota, at least. So then you have to cut him again and then put him on NFI. You're going to have to cut a roster spot to, to, to initially claim him. I mean, I think he's got some talent, like a good, good career at Pitt, but probably not worth all that hassle. Yeah, look, I mean, I, we don't know the extent of the injuries and, 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 you know, how much maybe weight he's lost. And, you know, and you're right. In order to first get him on the roster, you have to make a roster move and then add him. And right. then, uh, you know. You have to cut I him again know. to stash him, I guess, or, or keep well, him. Well, I mean, for... you, you could, have, you know, I mean, if he wasn't going to play and, you know, if he had a, an injury that wouldn't be uh, 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 filed a grievance against or something like that. You know, if, if, if he really had an injury or something along those lines, he probably wouldn't pass the, the, the physical to start with. Right. right. So there, it, it gets all kind of messy there, but let's assume, and that's dangerous to do. Let's assume you could sign him. And then there, there was enough there that you could put him on IR. Well, I would imagine, uh, him being a, 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 a young player, you would have some sort of a, uh, uh, split contract contract on him. So once he did go to IR, the split would 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 kick in and then that would be the cap charge that you would ride with uh throughout the season there. So from from what I've read on this, it it's not worth it right now. I mean, I, I, I don't think he's healthy enough or close enough to being healthy. I think if, uh, now obviously, uh, uh, and once again, we don't know the, 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 you know, how, how far away he is from, from, from being able to play. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe you just keep an eye on him and, you know, see how he's doing and then maybe look at him, you know, later on or something along, right. along those lines or, or after this season as a reserve future player or something like that. It doesn't mm-hmm. sound like he's going to be able to play anytime in the near future from right. what I gather. No, I'm with you because, like you said, there's just a conditioning thing, a weight thing, and, and all secondary to his personal health, but he's probably a little ways away from making an impact. And by the time he gets healthy, it's, you know, it, at the least it's probably September and, and the season's about to start, and that's just tough for, for a rookie to, to, to do. And people just think that you just can put get you know sign players and just you know, automatic like stash them on IR. Those guys have got to be re- legitimately injured, you know, because mm-hmm. because you split contracts and all like that. You'll have a grievance filed, uh, you know, on on you in a heartbeat. So you know, th- it's just not sign him and just stash him on I- IR. You know, mm-hmm. th- those kind of things. Plus, you hear that quite a bit, uh, right? Plus, it was kind of an unofficial rule not to claim those guys i know there was that big scuttlebutt i think the patriots did that to the giants with the tight end like five six years ago and i mean you can nothing says you can't do it but generally the guys that get hurt and, and teams are trying to stash him i think the underwritten rule is let those guys go through waivers shoes guns cars gaming zero one one two has a question for dave says dave why did you say now let's see how much the steelers like to our skipper when it's obvious they moved on because they cut him skipper was cut by the titans i think yesterday uh, and claimed off of waivers so what's uh what's the, the comment there dave no the it was just an overarching thought because mm-hmm. remember all the uh 
He was uh, Camp Darling, yeah. Yeah, all the all the stuff, and people said he'll never, you know, uh, he'll never clear waivers. He'll be gone. I can't believe the Steelers let this guy go. He went to the Giants. He, you know, in the limited playing time, I broke down the limited playing time that he got. It wasn't overly great. Uh, he became, uh, uh, he got cut by the Giants. He then landed on the uh the, uh, the Giants practice squad several weeks later, the Steelers uh, snatched him off the Giants practice squad. And then you fast forward to uh, what uh, what last season, I think, right? Or the end of last season. Then he ended up on the uh, uh, ended up with the Titans and bounced back and forth in 2020. I think three or four games on their roster. It was just more of a facetious Let's see how much they really yeah. <laughs> they 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 really did like him because I know a lot of people are still up in arms. Because look, he led the team in uh, uh, what do you have? He led the whole NFL in sacks in two, uh, preseason two thousand and what was that nineteen uh, there? And uh, it was just a, a more here here he is. Let's see how much the Steelers really like him. Right. I wasn't advocating the Steelers going after him. However, comma the lack of depth that they have at the outside linebacker position, it would have been a huge shocker. I mean, to pick up a minimum salary guy like that uh, there. But uh, I just uh, put out on Twitter earlier today that he indeed cleared waivers there. So uh, it was more of a just, uh, you know, funny, here he mm -hmm. is, let's see how much they really like him kind of thing. Yeah, he had that really strong camp, really strong preseason. The thing with Skipper, they, they just refused to play him on special teams until the last game of 2019. He had like, a couple tackles had a good showing, but just for something, I don't know what the reason was, but just was not a guy who got a hat on special teams and that, you know, made him a, a, an easy cut. Next question here comes from the last style bender who says, do you guys think Anthony McFarland will get over half of the snaps in the hall of fame game? Also, how do you expect the special teams to play without their captain of the past four years? Of course, referring to Jordan Dangerfield, we'll tackle the first question first. Um, it's hard to put a number on the percentage of snaps or the number of snaps and things like that. Obviously, there's. it, it sounds like, and we'll see, obviously, but it sounds like the vets and any of those guys, and maybe even not even Najee Harris, really just aren't going to play this game at all. Like It's going to be really exclusive to the backups or some of, some of those guys. Um, so I think McFarlane's going to play a considerable amount. I mean, I can't put an exact number on it, but I think he'll play, I mean, about half of the snaps. It sounds fairly accurate to me. Yeah, look, I mean... This is an extra game, so why not take the uh, uh, take the opportunity to look at your younger players, the guys that you don't know the most about, uh, uh, and, and and play them. Now, obviously, Najee Harris. Do you really want N Najee Harris to play thirty snaps in this game? I, I think probably not. Mm -hmm. You know, does he play uh, any snaps in this game? I. I <laughs> It could go either way. If he does play, he won't be out there long. I'll put right. it to you that way. Sure. Uh, you know, may, maybe you lather him up for two or three snaps. But I mean, why? You know, why? Why this early? You got you're going to have three more games after this. So, uh, I personally, I don't think I would. I, I you know, I already know what I have there. I'm, pr I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Najee Harris is going to make the 53 man roster. Uh, there. <laughs> so why not look at the Anthony McFarlands and give Benny Snell a couple three or four carries and Jalen Samuels and a few of those other guys, you got enough bodies to absorb those snaps there. So yeah, I mean, Anthony McFarlane should get a, you know, I, I don't know how to put a percentage on that, but he should get uh, a, a pretty decent look in that game. Yeah, for sure. Garrett Slingerland says I'd give him referring to Najee Harris, the first series and that's it. I'm cool with that. Yeah. Get him a snap or two, take him off the field. Just let him experience what it's like to prepare and play in your first NFL game. Cause I think there's some value in, preparing for your first game and getting maybe some of those nerves and those that anxiousness kind of out of the way. You know, Mike Tomlin's good too at not telling those guys beforehand anyway and making them go through the process and then mm -hmm. say, oh, by the way, you're not playing. Right. You know? Although this so, year, I mean, first day of camp, he's like, Kendra Green's a starting center, Antron Brooks Jr.'s in the slot. Like, he was right. not being shy about it this year. Yeah, but I'm talking about uh, right ahead of the game mm -hmm. time and all, you know. So. Right. No, I got you for sure. Next question here comes from Mike Adesso, who says, okay, who's both of your guys' prediction for this year's Camp Darling? Speaking of Camp Darlings, his is Isaiah McCoy, who I think might be your answer, Dave, the undrafted free agent out of Kent State. I mean, it's a dart throw. If we knew the Camp Darling was, he probably wouldn't be a Camp Darling. Um, I'll go with another receiver, though, and, and you've touched on him too, uh, Dave, Matthew Sexton, uh, the kid out of Eastern Michigan, who I think 
might not make a big impact even in camp as a receiver, but as a coverage guy, as, as a special teamer, I think could carve out a home there and is a pretty good straight line athlete. I think laterally agility wise, his testing was kind of poor, but um, had a good college career. And I could kind of see him being a little gadgety in this offense, but I think really maybe impressing Danny Smith. What, 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 what qualifies as a camp darling? Somebody that, yeah, you some know, some guy we're that, not talking about that, that plays well. But we'll make the fifty three or no? Well, I mean two star skipper was a camp darling and, and he didn't well, I guess he and he made it for like a week, right? And then got cut. But but just right. just putting that aside, putting the, the result aside, but just some guy that we're not talking about, some young guy that's going to have a strong preseason. Oh uh, yeah, well, I mean Let's see, a young guy uh, have a strong... I mean, you like McCoy, right? You were a big fan of McCoy. Yeah, I like McCoy. I am not so sure. I mean, there's a lot of bodies in that wide receiver line mm-hmm. that's uh, going to gonna, gonna be tough to uh, to uh, to separate there. Uh, I'll go with... Uh, I mean, Shakir Brown, that's too much of a give, e- e- uh, easy one, right? I mean, it's I, almost I, a little I think... on the nose. Uh, is is that a little little bit on the obvious side or no? I think a little bit. I mean, it's it's a good guess. I haven't heard much of him in camp so far. That's worth a whole lot, but I mean, maybe someone else. Um, uh, Mark Gilbert. How about that? Okay. I mean, he was a guy that it was a long time ago, pre-injury, but that what 2017 season for Duke he had like six or seven interceptions. I, I just worry about he's a really lanky guy. I wonder about some of that change of direction kind of stuff that that it's a little Justin Laneish for me. But I mean, it was talent there for sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's a guy that I don't think is going to have all the qualities, but he's going to probably make a. He probably, you know, you you would hope that that's the kind of guy that later in 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 meaning meaningless games going to maybe make a play or two. So, uh, I mean, if you want me to dig deep, I mean, that's me digging deep. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. No, it's a good call. Uh, hopefully, one of those undrafted guys in the secondary, the slew of them, they brought in the four of them after the draft. Now, I, I, now, I don't think he'd make the fifty-three man roster, but mm-hmm. I mean, if you want to talk about somebody that might end up kind of impressing throughout this thing, you know, maybe. Yeah. He's a guy because of height, weight, speed, you know, that right. kind of thing. Mutated Genome says, Alex, with the signing of Ingram, do you expect your Molly dealer to make the team? That's referring to Cassius March. I made a joke on Twitter about how he looked showing up for, for training camp. He responded back with, you know, taking it in, 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 in stride. So I respect and appreciate that. Will Marsh make it? And my 53 man roster, I think you had Marsh making it. I didn't. Um, he could because there is special teams value. And so I think he's got a chance. But am I current roster prediction I had Roche beating Marsh out. I think it could go either way with him, especially with the addition of uh, of Ingram. I mean, if Quincy Roche can give you that extra punch on special teams, then, uh, you know, might, might make Marsh expendable there. But uh, they do seem to just something about, I think they like, uh, I think they like uh, Cassius Marsh more than we like kids Cassius mm. Marsh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. uh, he's the first name that tends to come out of Keith Butler's mouth when he starts rattling down that uh, that depth chart. I don't know if it's just out of respect or 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 or, 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 or what there. But uh, if I was to bet right now, I'd say he makes it. But uh, I, I could also see scenarios where he doesn't. If you if you go on and keep. Uh, Keep keep only just four in total there. Right. But with the signing of Ingram, that kind of says that assuming there aren't significant injuries, that Marsh and Roche aren't going to play a lot out of the gate. So it really comes down to who does better on special teams. And Marsh, I think entering camp is going to have the leg up there. Yeah, Roche's definitely going to have to uh, show that, that aspect of the game to Danny Smith. Mm-hmm. Uh, Danny Smith already knows kind of what he has in, in Cassius Marsh. Look, Cassius Marsh has not been a bad special teams player throughout his NFL career, and that's why he's still got uh, one foot in the NFL, I think, mm-hmm. you know, so, uh, but if Roche can give you at least what, what, what Cassius Marsh gives you, and he shows so some propensity during uh, 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 training camp and, and, and preseason to at least a grasp or semi look like he knows what he's looking at there, understanding the defense and, and where to be on the field, uh, then, 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 you know, maybe, maybe there's a shot there. Now, don't forget that, you know, uh, uh, Cassius Marsh has been around a couple of NFL teams. He comes off as a really kind of smart individual there. So I, I imagine he knows the defense a lot 
better than Quincy Roche right now. Not that you want to see either one of those two guys on the field whatsoever, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, in, in 2021. And just to be a little fair to Marsh, because he received a lot of criticism, understandably so, last season. I mean, to come in off the Colts practice squad late in the season in that COVID pandemic year, and you're trying to get on the moving train and, and find a place to live and just all those things you don't think about, that, that's got to be tough to do. And so I think having a whole offseason, knowing your team, knowing your role, the scheme, as you said, picking it up, I think it's going to at least give Marsh the chance to be the best version of himself. How good that version is going to be, hopefully nothing more than a number four outside linebacker and special teams kind of guy, but puts him in a better spot to succeed this year than last season. Next question here comes from Storm Woodside, new name here, so glad to have you in the chat, Storm. says, hey guys, 2022 draft, if we don't go quarterback in round one of the draft, what would be our other position of need you will go? It's a good question. I could give you probably 10 different answers right now, but it's guard. Not, yeah, guard, probably. <laughs> Safety. Safety, left tackle, the last foul bender says. I mean, just based on the play of guys, who gets retained? Does Terrell Edmonds come back? A core for all the free agents, all the names that you guys know we've talked about. So, I mean, we could dice this up 17 different ways, I'm sure, but I know it isn't going to mean a whole lot here come, you know, even a month from now. We're not going to be talking about probably the same stuff we're talking about right now. So, I mean, you, would you say guard if you had to pick one right now? Oh, I mean, it could go, obviously, various different ways. But, I mean, th- this team's going to need another guard soon, I think. You know, yeah. so uh, uh, that that's obvious. Obviously, one position. What happens with uh, Terrell Edmonds? You know, you have to – I mean – I, I think the the uh, the smart bet is to think that Edmonds is going to be gone after this year. I, I think that's where most people would place their bets at right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, inside linebacker, you know, uh, could 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 be a possibility depending on what you know how things play out. Uh, obviously, this year as well too. So I would I would think that maybe uh, those would be my top three probably bets right now would be guard safety uh inside linebacker and i mean i don't think you can discount cornerback either i mean right. depending on how things play out you know is james pierre for real is uh you know uh we'll learn obviously more about that position as as, as the season goes on but you could probably be uh, by the end of the year talking about this team needs to draft a cor- cornerback early now i'm not not a fan of them drafting one in the first round you know, uh, especially if they're not high enough in the first round. Uh, so I envision if they're, you know, picking, let's say 20th or later, I could see it being a guard, a safety or an inside linebacker. Those are the kind of the players that end up, you know, falling in, in the first round yeah. that late there. Yeah, absolutely. I think all those make sense. I mean, I'll, I'll just say, you know, I think guard, I'll go tackle because of the importance of left tackle. And then I'll probably say, you know, strong safety slash slot corner, one of those two guys, um, you know, depending what happens with Edmonds and depending on the play guys like Antoine Brooks. So, uh, yeah, it, like I said, this thing could go 10 different ways. Next question here comes from Mark Leslie. Uh, good to hear from you, Mark. More of a general question, but do you think the Steelers can become a contender when Ben goes or does a team have to go bad before the before they become good again? Hope this makes sense. So Mark's basically asking, like, will you have to go through – you know, a post Bradshaw period of a team that's just kind of meh. I mean, if you find the next next quarterback quickly, then, you know, you can bridge that pretty easily the way the Packers did from, you know, Favre to Rodgers and, you know, things like that. So, I mean, it, it's not a death sentence where you're going to be a bad team. I mean, I don't think this team will be bad even post Ben. I think it'll be just maybe an average, you know, to below average slightly team. Um, but if you find that next quarterback, I mean, that kind of determines how much of a lull you have in your franchise. I mean, you obviously need a franchise quarterback if you're going to compete for a Super Bowl. So however long it takes them to get that. Now, can they keep the defense, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a good enough defense to, to together over the course, of, let's say, the next three years to at least give them a chance? Let's say if they went the, uh, the more – seasoned, I don't know, either, either free agent quarterback or, or whoever, I mean, you know, you would, you would think they'd at least be able to be at least a, close to a 500 team. Now, uh, obviously moving past that, uh, here it's obvious, you know, you need a pass defense. You got to have a pass defense, uh, to be able to compete for a Super Bowl, plain and simple. I think we've we've learned that through the adjusted net yards for passing attempt stat over the years. As far as offense goes, if you don't have a high-quality 
uh, quarterback, one that's going to register a you know six point eight uh, or higher adjusted net yards for passing attempt number, then you better have a running game. And obviously, they think they're addressing that right now. There, so I mean trying to figure out what happens. We're still trying to figure out what's going to happen in 2021. <laughs> so uh, trying to move past there. I mean, I think they've got enough good enough track record to kind of think that they, you know, that they, they would go through the motions, at least trying to be as competitive as possible. So, I mean, d- could we see a, you know, six and 11 season in there? It's possible. I think, I don't think he can roll that out, but be honest with you right now i'm not paying too much mind to that i'm, I'm mm-hmm. just focused on 2021 me too wanks the nation says enjoy the collab with adam Steele. thank you so so glad you did you can check it out on his channel of course or on the community tab on my channel I'll hopefully have him on my channel at some point later this season got a good question maybe more of a comment here but i, I agree with a sentiment here from uh, rich hud who says how much can you solidify depth i don't think any team goes four or five deep at every position i think that's a really good point i know you always talk about depth and you know, certainly areas of the Steelers team that, that needs to improve itself depth wise, but your depth is never going to be perfect. There's always going to be an element of unknown or, you know, being uncomfortable with who the next man up is just because that's, that's inherent. You can't be, you know, two starters deep at every single position and feel great about every single next man up uh, with the age of free agency and, you know, the, the draft being art, not science and stuff like that. I mean, there's always going to be questions there. Right? And the only way to get some of these young guys to play is to play I and mean, kind of go through, you know, sometimes you miss on the guy. Sometimes the guy struggles early on, and sometimes you got to throw him to the fire. Uh, Vince Williams is a great example of that. You know, in his his career, you know, Larry Foot goes out for the season week one, and he's got to be next man up and 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 play his rookie season. But it turned into a really long eight year career for him. So I think it's a really good point there, Rich. I mean, of course, you want to have as good depth as possible, but you're never going to always love your depth. Otherwise, those guys probably wouldn't be backups to begin with. Yeah, I don't think you'd ever have enough depth, right? right. I mean, I think you can always fiddle with the uh, with the fifty uh, first to fifty third spot on your roster and always try to keep keep upgrading. And I think Kevin Coward always tries to make a constant effort uh, to 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 do that. I, I you know once again, I I don't think I I think there's going to be at least one more addition to this team at at some point between now and 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 week one, which now is what forty eight. 49 days away, something like that, that ends up making this 53 man roster. Will it be a final cut down uh, 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 guy? Will it be Kevin Colbert, you know, training for a young player there right before the start of the regular season, like we've seen him do it before? Uh, no, I mean, you not you never can have enough depth. Look, I mean, if there's one position right now, I mean, you you could definitely use a safety. Uh, that uh, especially one that can that that, that 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 you can tie to the post and play some deep center field in case something were to uh, God forbid happen to to uh, to to Minka there. So you know, uh, and 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 if you got that that spot filled, then you'd probably say, well, what's going to happen? You know, maybe we can make a linebacker a little bit better there. So I think it's okay to constantly look at it, look at a a, a ninety man roster and say. You know, not deep enough there, not deep enough there. And and I think you go around the NFL and, and, and see that as well, too, because the salary cap is but as easy as it can be massaged or manipulated. You know, it's still limitations still exist there. So you can't, you know, ha- have, you know, uh, you really have to be smart putting that thing together depth wise mm-hmm. and your draft obviously plays a big, big role in that. The better you draft, especially the deeper the picks and all like that, and get some of those uh, to to uh to stick uh the better off your depth ends up being absolutely got a cap question here from mutated genome so this is up dave's alley where are the steelers at with dead money for the 2022 season and is it significant Uh, i know you tweeted that out earlier today i have your latest cap update article for 2021 but just kind of talk about the melvin ingram deal with voidable years and where that leaves his team dead money wise for next off season well, I mean, for to uh, to to start with, there uh, you have now over twenty million. You have twenty two uh, twenty two point one eight four set up to be dead money just off of four contracts that have uh, voidable aspects to them, and and you know, I think at least three of these four. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 void date is five days after the Super Bowl. There, so. Uh, obviously something can be worked out right before that void date 
Uh, but even so, the prorations, you know, all that's going to do is quit uh, 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 is to stop the prorations from accelerating into the year. If you could work something out there now, do I think that's going to happen with a lot of these these contracts? No, I think uh, I think Melvin Ingram uh, is, is is going to void, and then all that money comes forward. I think uh, Eric Ebron is the, is another one. I think that's going to void, and then all that money come forward. Uh, Juju, I mean, I, I really envision that 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 uh, voiding and all that coming forward. And then that leaves you with Roethlisberger as the last one, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as, as far as that goes now, as far as dead money past that, I think the only other dead money out there right now in 2022 would be uh, 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 Calvin Bundage, I think, uh, uh, because they just cut, uh, cut him. I, I think he had some of that. Uh, what, 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 what did he have as a signing bonus? Was I very think it was, small. Uh, $3,000. I want to say. Uh, no, what it like fifteen thousand or was something? Was it fifteen thousand? Uh, Either way, like I mean, that. it's a very small number in terms of the, the the grand scheme of the cap. Right. I mean, that that that's the only other thing out there. So, I mean, look at it right now. Now, obviously, that's going th th that amount's going to grow. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, on, on into next year. I'm trying to pull up uh, uh bondage here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was uh seventy five hundred dollar signing bonus for Calvin Bundage and uh, you cut him. So that's 2,500, uh, which was already counting 2,500 uh, against the cap this year. Uh, anyway, that's dead this year. Now the, uh, he has the, an extra $5,000 that's dead in 2022. And people say, well, they signed him back. Well, it don't, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You can't, as I like to say, you can't resuscitate dead money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once it's dead, it's dead. So what what did they just sign him back to? They signed him back to a uh, uh, a contract for for a minimum salary, which he was already scheduled to make uh, this year. So really, there's no bad, you know, thing that that you know, no really financial. Uh, backflip or whatever just by cutting because he was already going to count the same thing this year against the cap as he counts right now. The only difference is now is it automatically put $5,000 into the dead money uh, column for 2022. Yeah, okay. So that's where they're at. Dead money, certainly a good chunk of it. As you said, it will grow. And then from a current year cap space, just to kind of put a bow on the post, you have this team in terms of effective Usable camp space at 1.3 million with restructures of two in Boswell, 6.3, and currently they're at 11.7 million under the cap. Yeah, they're right at that point. They've got this thing right now where it makes you wonder. You're at you're at that stage where you say, will they indeed redo to it or Boswell now? You know, because mm -hmm. if you think right now, technically they're at this given moment, they're 11.7 underneath the cap. Now, when you look at the head at the other expenses that they're going to have, uh, you know, they, they really basically have about 1.3 uh, 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 effective cap space to work with there. There's going to be some attrition, obviously, here, you know, that where they might pick up, uh, I don't know, um, maybe at max another million dollars if some of those guys on up there, you know, end up don't make an making a 53 man roster there. So you'll pick up maybe a little bit of cap space there. If a rookie makes a make, makes the 53 over, let's say a guy like Cassius March or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, you're going to pick up a little play, a little bit there. So uh, then obviously what's going to happen with the TJ Watt uh, extension? I, you know, obviously I think most people will bet that it's going to happen. I will be surprised if it doesn't. The only big question there is what happens to his cap number? Uh, it's 10.089 right now. Is it going to go up some? Is it going to stay the same? That's the that's the million dollar question. I uh, hate, hate to put the pun on it right there. But uh, there are ways. Look, I mean, you could give him a base salary of $1.089 million. You could give a signing bonus of $45 million. His signing bonus is probably going to be somewhere in that neighborhood. If the Steelers do contracts if, if they do his contract the way they normally do the non quarterbacks uh, as far as guaranteed money you could see him have a signing bonus of somewhere between 40 and 45 million dollars would be my estimation if it is 45 million and he gave him a base salary of 1.089 million 
Guess what his cap number is? 10.089 million, just exactly what it is uh, 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 right now there. So, uh, look, if they're going to restructure to it and Boswell, we'll find out here in the next, I don't know, three weeks, I mm-hmm. think, that they'll, they'll, they'll get the ball uh, rolling on that. But uh, they definitely have enough space right now that even if they wanted to go out and get another backup safety for $2.5 million or, or so, they, they could definitely swing that. Yeah, but it will not be Malik Hooker, who is signing with the Dallas Cowboys. So I know that disappointed a lot of Steelers fans. Got a super chat here from Gaming with Geo. Thank you for the $5 super chat. Much appreciated. Says, congrats to the Browns, three-time offseason champions. Yeah, uh, they are killing the offseason. But I think they have a legitimately good team this year. I think last year was a big prove-it year for them. And who knows what will happen, obviously. But I think that franchise is, for the first time in a long time, you know, stable, steady, and headed in the right direction. And just a reminder, if you guys want to ask a question, be sure to do so. Dave and I are here till 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. If you could like the uh, the live stream as well, that would certainly help us out and get more people into the stream as well. Let me scroll back up here and find where the next question was at. Uh, Mike Adesso, random question of the day. Who's the voice of the terrible podcast intro? I don't think I even know the answer to this one. Do you know who the? I would, uh, I would have to go back and look myself. I uh, shame it's been a while. I don't have that on. It's been a while since somebody you know, re- recorded that for me there. So I'm gonna have to go. I, I don't. I don't remember uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, it was somebody who would just. I think we had put out a call for somebody to do some voiceover work or something, and somebody on Twitter, I'm guessing, connected with yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a story there. Uh, I apologize. No, I don't have that right. on top of my head. John Pennington, from an earlier discussion, would you guys rather have Skipper or Marsh? I mean, if I mean, Marsh is a better, yeah. Marsh is a better, more experienced guy, better special teams player. So, I mean, that's where I'm, where I go. I mean, really, I, 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 I hope we don't have to see. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was hemming and hawing about. Yeah, uh, but anybody on the field, you know, other than the top three. Yeah, make me choose. I'll go with uh, Cassius Marsh. Robert Arnold, how did you two start your Steelers fandom? I know Alex is from Pittsburgh, but how did a Florida boy like Dave become a Yinzer? Yeah, my story is super boring. It's just geography, really, because I was I grew up here in Western PA. Dave, I know you've told this story a couple times, but always worth retelling. Why did you become a Steelers fan? Yeah, I've, I've told it numerous times. I grew up in Northwest Florida. My dad, uh, I'm, I'm obviously in my 50s now, so that dates me there. Uh, born in 68. My dad was in the uh, ex-Navy and was a Roger Stallback fan and uh, kind of a quasi- uh, uh, Cowboys slash Miami Dolphins fan at the time. He really didn't, wasn't huge into football, but I mean, he did watch it and cheer for those two teams, uh, being the bratty kid that I uh, was and, and later became a bratty adult. Uh, it was always fun to, uh, to cheer against the old man, uh, game against the, I guess I was around four years old, around 19, I don't know, 72. Evidently the Cowboys and the Steelers were playing on television. The cow, I think the Steelers were giving them, uh, giving it, uh, all, you know, uh, it was a competitive game. It, my dad was upset with the Steelers. That made me happy. All of a sudden, I took great joy in that. Just one thing out, out of another, everything became black and gold. And uh, I guess you could say it just started because uh, I was anti. Uh, my dad didn't like uh, like the Steelers, so I liked the Steelers. So that, that's right. how it kind of all started there. There you go. Jesse Hernandez asks, Dave initially gave Chase Claypool a third round grade. This was back in the 2020 draft. At this moment, knowing what we do now, do you keep that same grade? Also, your take as well, Alex. Dave, I'll I'll let you answer that question first. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, you come into the league, you you uh, you you register what eleven? What do you have? Eleven touchdowns last mm-hmm. year, sixty over sixty receptions for for uh, uh, close to nine hundred yards. There, I mean, you get that kind of production out of a guy, then he's got to at least be a second round uh, uh, product at, at at that point. Look, the main difference, yeah, and, and uh, it was a third round grade based on. The, the, the class overall, too. And one of the biggest knocks that I had on Chase Claypool overall was his his ability to separate, to to stack, uh, and, and make the plays down the field uh, consistently that way. That was the thing that had me, uh, ha- that had me a difference between a third round grade and a second round grade on Chase Claypool was mostly his ability to, to consistently stack uh, corners on the outside. That was the, one of my biggest concerns about him. Uh, I, 
I think Daniel, when Daniel was with us, I think he uh, uh, highlighted uh, Chase Claypool right out of the Senior Bowl. Danny, I mean, that was one of the first people mm-hmm. I think we we were writing about on the site. And I instantly did like a four-game contextualization or a five-game contextualization on Chase Claypool. I think that was the first one that I did during that uh during that draft season there, mm. uh, you could see he could, that he could make the contested catches down the field. Uh, you could see he could, uh, uh, you know, may move him around quite a bit. You could see he was a physical player. You could see he was good on special teams. It's just, you know, as far as the speed goes, yeah, he timed, I think, what did he time? Four, four, six or three or something, four, four, five, somewhere around in there. Uh, you know, my biggest concern was the ability to 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 consistently be able to stack on the outside, and it's still kind of a concern when it comes to me uh, 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 and Chase Claypool. But I think just what he's shown uh, uh, at the NFL level, just rookie season alone. I mean, yeah, why, I mean, if you were to do a redraft right now, no way he gets out of the second round. Yeah, he may not get out of the first either. I don't know exactly how I would draw the line. I don't think about it that often in terms of of those terms. But uh, yeah, much higher grade. Uh, present day than where he was. And yeah, this was the tweet back January 21st, 2020, uh, about Claypool meeting the Steelers very soon. And uh, now he's with the team. All right, next question here will come from, I want you to scroll back up here to find it. Joker Smoker, what's Dan Moore's best trade? I think you've watched more, a little bit more than I have. I would just say he's a good athlete. I think he's an athlete with a lot of experience and, and kind of battle tested in the SEC. So when you have somebody that's a good athlete against quality competition and has done reasonably well, I think it's always been a good foundation for an NFL tackle trying to make the jump to, to the NFL. Uh, Dan Moore and his tape, there's not one thing that, that, you know, that I think jumps off the tape with him, at least not, not to me in the, in, in, in the four or five games that I watched on him. Just, just, uh, if I would say anything that's a plus with him, it would be hand usage, okay. I think. Uh, because uh, uh, I thought he was good at, at, at knocking away some of those hands and just using those hands overall. So I think if there was one thing that I'd point to that I would say with Dan Moore that I said, boy, that's impressive there. That's what caught my eye in the three or four games that I watched on him. I would I would say probably hand usage. Yeah, that's fair. And uh, we'll get to watch him. He's running first team here with a core four not participating in team drills. We'll see when that changes when a core four gets back into the lineup, but a lot of valuable reps there for Dan Moore, and I figure he'll play a ton of snaps in the Hall of Fame game against Dallas. Duck Swagger says, Hi, Alex and Dave. Why would the Steelers sign Ingram to a voided contract and not fry the $4 million over with when we have a decent amount of cap uh, right now? So basically saying, why do they do the voidable year deal with Melvin Ingram? Yeah, I think just so they could say, you know, we'll, I will probably better be able to answer that question maybe in a couple more weeks. You know, uh, we'll see if uh, if maybe a move such as if they don't make any more moves and if for some reason they don't end up having to uh, restructure the contract of, uh, uh, of, of to it and Boswell, then maybe that's your answer right yeah. there. Uh, I was a bit surprised at just with a four million with a four million dollar contract that they uh, that they didn't just eat eat the elephant all in one bite there because I mean, what'd you end up saving two point something million in cap space. But, uh, I, I think we'll better be able to look back at their decision to do this with what, what may or may not happen in the next 40, 48 days or what, what, what have you there. So, uh, I, uh, you know, here's the thing you, you, you risk uh two point, three four million dollars you just kicked into 2022 by doing the uh the four-year voidables with him so obviously you would have had to account for that uh 2.34 million this year uh uh had you not done that so uh it's obviously cap related there they feel more comfortable about the cut the, about, about their, their their cap situation what it would be in 2022 and once again i think uh you know uh you know, several more weeks from now 
uh, ask that question again. And let's mm-hmm. look back and see if Stefan Tuitt has been restructured. Maybe they're doing their best to not have to restructure those two guys. Because right. once again, you know, if you look right now, now look, I would I would have bet you uh, a lot of money uh, heading into uh, even as, as early as three or four weeks ago that Stefan Tuitt and, and, and Chris Boswell were slam dunks to get restructured. But, you know, as we sit here right now, they're right kind of at that area cap wise and into training camp where it makes you kind of wonder maybe they're trying to stay away from that. Uh, Now, uh, obviously, the T.J. Watt deal, once again, you know, will answer more questions as far as that goes. So uh, uh, we'll see. I, I don't have a hard, fast answer as far as why. You know, I, I think we'll learn as the offseason, rest of the offseason plays, plays out to be able to look back at that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's an answer that will reveal itself by, you know, the start of the season. Yeah, it may be where they decide maybe they don't have to restructure to it. They could they could have done it with restructure to it, which pushes money into next year, or the voidable year deal of Ingram, which pushes money into next year. So maybe they decided that it was better to do it with Ingram than it was to it for whatever mathematical reason. Mike Adesso, I don't remember the I don't remember how the daily camp updates go. Are they audio posts from both you guys every evening? Yes. So we'll have our camp diary, which is the full article the write-up of it i'll pull up an example here uh for you michael of what those things look like because it's been a long time since our last one and then dave and i should be able to do kind of a half hour 45 minute or so podcast each evening uh to recap what happened at training camp that day so that'll be the format of the uh the camp flow and schedule and then during the day while Alex is at camp, we usually have like what's called a, a live blog post. And mm-hmm. I try to uh, specifically have, you know, search generated uh, like a Twitter feed or something like, like in there embedded into a post. So if you, you know, that way you can kind of stay abreast and obviously Alex's tweets will be in, uh, in, in, in that live blog as well too. So make sure you check out the, uh, the site during the day and check out the live blog post while practice is going on. So you can kind of stay abreast of what's happening. You know, we'll have several of the beat writers, you know, listed in there. And like I said, Alex, and obviously the team Twitter feed and, 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 and those kind of things there. So it kind of give you a kind of a, a, a running live blog while practice is going on. Then Alex will provide his diary about a few hours after practice ends. And then we'll wrap it all up with kind of a 30 minute, you know, mini a recap right. podcast uh, uh, with, with myself and Alex. And everything should come a little bit earlier this year. The reports, the podcast, because practices are now at, you know, 12, 130 as opposed to being at 255. So hopefully that'll get things in a little bit quicker uh, this camp. Our uh, next question, actually, Jason, thanks for being here. It says, peace and love, DNA. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate you hanging out with us. Be sure to get your questions in here. 15 more minutes before we wrap up today's stream. Next question comes from Wanks the Nation. Do you all think Pittsburgh has a chance at Rodgers next year when he leaves Green Bay? I'm surprised it took this long to get our first Aaron Rodgers question here for the stream. I mean, do I think it's going to happen? No. Can I say that it's zero? I mean, I guess I can't say that. I mean, theoretically, I guess they could have the space, and I could see the attraction of Rodgers maybe wanting to come for Pittsburgh, but obviously he's been well-connected to Denver and maybe some warmer places out west, things like that. So, um, I mean, is it a 0% chance? No. I'm sure it'll get talked about a whole lot this time in the offseason, but uh, I I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, do I? I mean, uh, (laughs) I... I, (laughs) I I, I want to um uh I want to try to figure out the best way to answer this when not uh, I, mean, I don't you can't say happen. it's a zero chance though right I mean that's I mean, that's probably going it, a little too far I mean anything can happen right yeah so uh, but uh, I I will be shocked if a Deshaun Watson or Aaron Rodgers or I I I, I just cannot envision it no yeah. Uh, same here, but it'll get talked about. And I mean, if Ben does retire, then that storyline is going to get front of the line, whether it's one. I mean, if, or he, not. If, if, if you know, if they try to uh, obviously too, if you know, from my understanding, at least early on, is that you know, if if, if you know, two thousand, I think two thousand twenty three is the voidable year, right? right. It'll be it, through twenty twenty two is when he's so. Uh, uh, basically, then what 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 Packers would have to do is trade him mm-hmm. next off season, and then for whatever his you know, you would inherit whatever salary that he's set to earn. And then you'd have to give up whatever you give up in return on top of it there. I just, just on those parameters alone and knowing that he's probably going to have a salary, you know, way on up there. Sure. Uh, it just, 
and then what you'd have to give to get him on top of it. Uh, you just those two things alone, and not knowing anything else, make it highly unlikely that he's going to land mm-hmm. with the Steelers. Got a couple of super chats here. Really appreciative and grateful for that one from Vegas TJG. Love the show, fellas, and the rain in Vegas. Twenty dollars super chat. Thank you so much. Was it raining in Vegas today? Yeah, this the last wow. couple of days. There's actually been some of that wet stuff fall from the ground. Wow. You guys need fall, it out fall there. from the sky to the ground. Yeah, from the say. ground. <laughs> and, and every time it does rain here, you get these alerts on your phone, flash flood warning, because really? Leo's just not, not used to having that, 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 that kind of uh, rainfall here. So uh, very, very kind of weird week here in Vegas here. A couple of days of uh, uh, wet stuff coming from the mm. sky. Got a it's super like I'm back in Florida again. <laughs> Got a super chat here from Rich Hud. Five dollars. Thank you so much, Rich. How much better would you feel about the offensive line of the Steelers had they drafted a premium center in round two? Yeah, I mean, I was I would have taken Creed Humphrey in round one. So I mean, he was the guy that I was really targeting in round two, at least hoping the team would target. I think, you know, if you were going to argue at any point the Steelers should have taken an offensive lineman earlier than they did, I don't think you you could really argue that at. 24 because there weren't really weren't any offensive linemen who were readily available. The next offensive lineman who didn't who went after pick 24 was Landon Dickerson at 37, a guy I liked a whole lot, but of course had a lot of medical concerns and falls clear out of the first round. Um, it was a second round where offensive linemen went off the board right after the pick of Pat Frymuth at 55. Now the reports on Frymuth early on have been positive, and I still like the pick overall. But to your point, that's I think where you would potentially criticize and scrutinize. The, de- the decision of the team more so than you would in round one. But uh, bottom line is, I mean, you know, we'll see what Kendrick Green looks like and kind of go from there. Yeah, I think uh, if you want a, a cross section guys that'll kind of be linked together from this draft class moving forward, it'll obviously be uh, 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 Firemuth and then, you know, Creed Humphrey and, you know, obviously the guy they ended up drafting to be their center in Kendrick Green, and you know the round three guy, and like, even Leonard Dickerson too, I think, because uh, if if that guy's not injured, you know, or, or didn't have the injuries that he had, I should say, uh, where did where does he fall in in all this? And remember, there were those reports, you know, whether or not how how true they were from Tony Pauline that boy, not only did the Steelers like Najee Harris during the process, they liked Landon Dickerson as well. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. You know? So uh, uh, I think if you circle those four guys right there, you know, uh, those are the kind of guys that I think, you know, you, you, you know, one, two, three years from now, you kind of look back on and say, well, what kind of happened here with this guy and that guy? Did they make the right choice? You know, uh, and I don't think you can judge these things till about three years after the fact, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, I think Creed is the most obvious one. Uh, 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 to put maybe put in that second hole. Right, right. Uh, I saw that I think Garrett in the last style banner were talking about you know not wanting to restructure to it because of you know the difficult off season he's had with the the death of his brother. Again, a restructure is not a pay cut; it's just moving money around. So I don't think two would be against that. There's no real reason for him to to be against that. So just to, to clarify, it's not that he's taking less money in any sort any sort of restructure. No, all a restructure is you're taking uh, uh, money that that players do, and then your uh, 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 portion of his, let's say, roster bonus or, or 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 base salary, and all you're doing is taking a chunk of that and turning it into a signing bonus, and then uh, then then doing that, and then then formulating some sort of payout on that. He still mm-hmm. gets the, the money that he's due. Uh, it's just you're restructuring how the accounting goes on it, because what you're able to do with whatever amount that you turn into a signing bonus, you're able to uh, 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 stretch that out for cap purposes, accounting as, 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 you know, as much as five years or however many years is left on the contract. All right. So which, whichever is, is, is less there. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's all a cap maneuver. Uh, it's not the player taking less right. money. Uh, and I think a lot of people uh, have the perception that a restructure means the player is losing money. No. Right, right. Want to get to a couple more questions here quickly before we wrap up today's stream. Duck Swagger, last question. Is our 2022 cap space deceiving because we have to sign Watt and Minka and stuff and won't actually have too much space? They're going to have space much more than they did this past year, much more than they have in in the past several seasons. But, yeah, I think that those are elements we forget about. They only have, what, what's the number, 36 plays on the contract for next season um, and a good amount of dead money as well that's added up, including with the Ingram 
voidable year deal. So there is less money than I think a lot of people make it out to be, but they're still going to have a, a healthy amount of space for next offseason. Yeah, I mean, look, if you don't have the franchise quarterback involved, then yeah. you, you, you're you going to be that better alone, right? And right. then this is a pretty much a younger roster overall that's, that, that's, that's kind of transitioning uh, on, on top of it there. Now, what's what's TJ Watt second? Let, let's say you get TJ Watt done now. I mean, you're probably going to have a cap number around $25 million for TJ Watt in, in, in 2022. Now, obviously there's probably going to be some sort of a, uh, 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 roster bonus. The Steelers normally stack up the pretty good sizable roster bonus in year two, as part of those, those, those long, long-term contract, ex- uh, extensions that if need be, you could, you could restructure that, turn it into another signing bonus and then get cap cap relief that way there. So, uh, I, I, you know, but he, here's the thing, you know, let's find out. I, there's no sense on, of me doing any kind of cap update for 2022 until we see what the, we, until we see what the watt numbers are mm-hmm. plain and simple, right, you know, right. and, and also what, what we see, how, you know, some of these guys that are currently under contract for 2022 <laughs> aren't going to be under contract for 2022 in about 40 something days. Right. right. Yeah, because a lot of these uh, 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 rookie undrafted free agents are, and, 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 and bit players are going to be gone off the record. Now, on top of it, there is you still have to mock out a top rule of 51. So let's say you got 36 guys under contract. You just can't look at how much you're under the cap at that point because you've got to fill in the other. You know, uh, uh, yeah, even if, if it's with rookie base salaries, you got to come up with a mock uh, uh, rule of 51 there to give you a better assessment there. So, yeah, I mean, overall, is if, if Roethlisberger's not back, they, you know, they're, they're, they're going to have considerable amount of cap space. Mm-hmm. Alex says, what's going to change with Canada being the new OC? It goes on to say that Ben felt like he was out of rhythm last year. Hopes they push the ball downfield more this year. I mean, we'll see. We'll start getting eyes on it Wednesday. But I think one thing we can definitely – uh, assure you, Alec, is that you'll see a lot more pre-snap motion. This team should be probably top 10, maybe even top five in pre-snap motion uh, this year. And that can come in many different forms and, and shapes, obviously. But I think we're going to see that because that is a hallmark of Canada's offenses. Well, we better see a little bit more under center, better see a little bit more play action. I, th- I think you've written and talked about uh, some pistol that that, that hopefully yeah. we're going to see a little bit this year. Uh, I think the main overarching thing is how much can we see them do a lot out of things that look the same? Yeah, I think the constraint plays are going to be really important for this offense this year. Shaquille Gregory says, is Nikhil Roby Coleman injury prone? What's the deal with him? I mean, he's a guy I like. He's a kind of scrappy slot guy. I don't remember his whole injury history. I think he's had some. Did he break his leg or something? Um, I don't know his whole history, though, and uh, the injury proneness of, of, of uh, Roby Coleman there, Shaquille. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Next question here comes from... Uh, let me try to find someone else. Mike Odessa is saying, are there going to be other guys from the Depot team going out to camp any days yet? Tim Rice will be there for the first couple, taking photos for the site. So really excited about that. Don't believe David O will be able to make it out to camp this year, but Tim uh, will Kirst, be there. Kirst, I want to answer Kirst Mimmed here. He says my stutter is bad. Yeah, I have a stuttering problem. I was born uh, with it. You know, it's kind of a uh, mental disorder. So, yeah, I apologize. I, I do stutter quite a bit. No, no need to apologize. Um, I think no, that's, that's certainly not your fault uh, uh, one bit. Uh, let's see. A couple more questions here before we wrap things up. John says, will the team sign another center in the next week? They could for depth. They won't be a notable name. Obviously, J.C. Hostenauer with that knee injury or whatever he's got going on. I mean, Tomlin called it day-to-day. Dr. Mel isn't so sure that it is day-to-day. It could be more extensive and, and a longer absence than that. But uh, I think Finney returned. Green's back, so they have some bodies there. So if they do, it'll be just kind of your – Typical training camp roster shuffle. Uh, let's see. Finding one or two more questions. Who do we have behind Ebron at tight end, though? Not much. I'm excited about Fryermuth. Reports, again, have been positive on him. Uh, the pads are not on yet, though, so how guys look in pads can be much different than how they look without pads. Uh, and then Kevin Raider is a good blocker, special teamer, although his upside is is pretty low. But, uh, you know, you got Fryermuth and Raider. I think that's, a, that's an okay, a, a decent to okay uh, top three tight ends with Ebron at the top. Yeah, you're gonna it's gonna be interesting to see what happens here with uh, with that third spot. Can can Gentry finally make some headway that way? I mean, you know, blocking in special teams right now. You think 
you know, Radar has has the uh, the better chance than than Gentry does because Raider is the better blocker and better special teams player. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the infamous Tim, do you think Cam Sutton plays better inside or outside? I kind of like on like him on the outside more because, well, he's improved his physicality and tackling. He's still not that ideal fit in the slot in terms of physicality and, 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 and taking on the run and things like that the way that Mike Hilton could. So uh, I think Sutton can play literally anywhere in the secondary. That's kind of his biggest calling card and value. But I at least want to see more of him as an outside right corner, and I think we will this season. And I think uh, one of our last questions here, uh, Garrett Slingerland, I think Minka will be the highest paid safety next year. Probably, right, Dave? I, uh, it, yeah, it's trending that way. I, I mean, mean, it's Simmons hard to is imagine. top right now, I think. Uh, we'll see who's the uh, who's the former uh, who, who's uh, Adams. Uh, yeah, I think Jamal is Adams. That, uh, that that that's up next. I think so. Uh, uh, this thing's still got you know, way, a ways, I think, to play itself out here at the position here. And I think, let me, before we get out of here, let me pull these numbers up here. Uh, Simmons right now is what, 15.25? Whew. I mean, that's, uh, that's a stout number. That That's currently the uh, the number to beat. We'll see what happens with uh, with Adams, I guess, would be probably the next one, I would think, that, that might have a chance at that. So, uh a year from now, uh, other uh, who would get paid other than maybe Adams? That's got to be about it, right? Yeah, I'd have to look at the list. Maybe there's a name that's slipping my mind, but I, I don't think anyone's going to get paid more than Minka when the time comes. Yeah, I mean, we could be talking about I don't know seven, maybe seven, somewhere around the seventeen million number if he has a good CEO, you know, another All Pro kind of Pro Bowl type season. Uh, that could wind up being uh, the number a year from now. I don't mm-hmm. obviously, I don't think it's going to happen this. Year. There's no reason to do it now. I think you, I don't think you have to do it now. Uh, they obviously picked up his fifth year option, and the the time frame would then put that into a new deal uh, right at around a year from now. Yeah, and Adams is basically a linebacker anyway. I actually, I actually think they're comp- Comparing his deal to Bobby Wagner, so it's almost impossible to compare Jamal Adams and Minka Fitzpatrick anyway. And last question here: What are the chances Kendrick Green wins a starting job this year? I still a, a, a good ways to go, but I think they're high. I think that the intent is for the team to have him be the starting Week One center against the Bills, and so long as he doesn't screw that up royally with mental mistakes and bad snaps and obviously health, uh, I think he'll be the guy. What do you think, Dave? Kendrick Green? We yeah, I, 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 the bar is so low. I mean, <laughs> I'd be I, like I've said from from day one here when it comes to Kendrick Green, I'll be disappointed if he's not the center week one because uh, because of how low that 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 bar is right now. Man, how long is J.C. Austin are going to miss right now? Right. Uh, with, with you know with with that MCL. So uh, if Kendrick Green can stay healthy, he should get a lot of work here during during training camp and the preseason. So uh, I think the story will be if it if it if green isn't the week one center that's that's the story if you ask me mm-hmm. and bj finney to my knowledge which is limited right now has not even been running first team guard uh with dots now it's been rashad coward at left guard so take that for whatever it's worth mm. all right guys that's going to wrap up today's stream thank you so much we'll have a ton of training camp coverage i plan to have training camp videos and some maybe quick segments and some videos taken at training camp when i'm allowed to film uh, for the channel, and certainly next time Dave and I talk two weeks from now, we'll have uh, knee-deep in Hall of Fame game stuff and training camp and just a lot of hopefully starting to form some answers to the questions you guys asked tonight. So thank you guys for being here. Really appreciate it. Like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And Dave Bryant, as always, thanks for joining me. Yeah, sorry for all the stuttering, folks, uh, and uh, peace and love to everybody. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening, and we will talk to you soon.